Arthur, thanks for being with us today in this amazing event of Adopt AI. Uh, Arthur, I will start by introducing yourself and, and then we'll uh, ask you a few questions. Uh, so you graduated uh, from Polytechnic and ONS uh, in 2015 and then you started your career in research. Uh, you completed a PhD at INRIA here in France and then you started your career and worked three years at uh, DeepMind uh, on uh, large language models. Uh, then you started to uh, you, you, you started your own company, Mistral, one year ago. That probably everyone uh, knows about today. Um, and you did uh, one of the most amazing seed round uh, that already existed, 105 million in June 2023, so almost one year ago now. Uh, and then a second one, 385 million uh, Serie A funding in December. Since then, you launched already three open source models and two closed source, Mistral small and large. You launched the application Le Chat, uh, which is our French chat GPT. And uh, more recently, Codestral, which is a fine-tuned model for uh, developers. So my first question, Arthur, will be uh, about this uh, impressive speed. How do you maintain this uh, cadence? And uh, for what reason are you uh, such in a hurry? And do you, uh, do you think you will maintain this high frequency over the time? Thank you. Um, I mean, we go fast because it's a fast market. So that's the, and, and there's an enormous demand from developers to play around with new models and to, uh, to integrate them to, to make gains in, on efficiency, on performance. Um, and so we effectively optimize for speed uh, because as a young company, it's very useful to, uh, to get users. Uh, now we are at the stage where we are consolidating a little bit the, um, the offer that we have uh, with models that are spanning the entire space of uh, performance and efficiency. And last week, we just introduced our first model that is specialized and dedicated to, to specific use case, uh, which is developer productivity. So you should expect that we will be consolidating. We will be bringing new models that are even better and those take longer to train. So it will uh, potentially uh, reduce a little bit in the cadence, uh, but the consolidation and the product is going to get better and better. Can you explain a bit more your, your vision and how you, differenti your, you differentiate yourself from the competition? We see the competition is really incredible. What is your positioning in the market and how you differentiate yourself? So we, we target the developer audience. So we really think that in order to build differentiated applications, the developer should do more than just prompting, should be able to take uh, models, modify them, specialize them to their knowledge, uh, their user base, uh, some demonstration data that they may have produced by their employees. And this is actually pretty hard to do. It requires to have some skills, and those are the skills that we want to bring to the market. Um, we really believe in efficiency, so we've produced models that are uh, on the frontier of efficiency, so for a certain size, a certain cost of ownership, uh, they, they produce the best reasoning performance, and this is really core to our values. And I guess the last thing is that we propose and provide independence to uh, our customers from the hyperscalers. Uh, AI, because it's a costly technology, is very much tied to the existing cloud providers. Uh, it's great, but it's also great to have alternatives that are independent, that allows to do on-prem deployment, virtual private cloud deployment, and basically be future-proof uh, in your cloud strategy. Uh, and the flexibility we provide to developers uh, is, is um, guarantees that. Thank you. So you cannot speak about all the data you use to train your model because it's, uh, how we say in French, the secret des affaires. But can you give us a sense on how you can ensure your clients that you respect all laws regarding intellectual property, GDPR, and of course, AI Act? And sub-question to that, we see some players like OpenAI doing some private deals uh, with Le Monde, for example. Is it something you want to do in the next coming months to also enrich with private, private data? Yeah, so we train on the public domain, we train on, on the open web, we filter everything that is not, uh, that, that has opt out, for instance. Um, we, we obviously don't train on user data because this is useless. When you, when, you, when you train a large language model, you don't want it to be uh, seeing any form of user data. You just want it to, know, to have knowledge. And so this is typically something that uh, we filter at the very beginning because this is low quality data. 
Now, on the application part, uh, the applications that we release obviously are GDPR compliant. Uh, they have cookies, so you can see that with the banner. Um, the, um, on the second part of your questions, I think there's, there's a lot of synergies to be found in between uh, um, application builders and uh, say content providers. And uh, we're effectively in discussion with many of them uh, to be able to bring uh, the value of uh, highly validated, human curated content to uh, the products that we sell. Alors, so together, uh, Mistral Artifact and also uh, Giscard, which is a uh, French uh, society, we receive an important uh, sponsorship from uh, France 2030, and we commit uh, together to uh, uh, publish open source model using uh, open data from INA, for example, or BNF. How can you share a bit your feeling about that, and how is it important for you to com contribute uh, through open source to the French community as well? So I think the reason why we started the company is to bring the field to, toward more openness and toward more sharing of information. This is really something that was disappearing from the field uh, starting from 2022, uh, and we wanted to bring it back, and I think to some extent we've managed to do it because many other large companies have actually followed us in that path. Uh, so it's very important because we're talking about the technology which, is, uh, which shapes culture. It produces content. And as a content producer, you do have an, an impact on what people read, and so you shape the future culture. And in that respect, uh, it's very important to be able to take some uh, French knowledge, for instance, this is the reason why BNF is part of the consortium, uh, and pour it into uh, the model so that it has a good understanding on how we should speak good French and how we should have uh, the French culture. Uh, so that's the, yeah, this cultural aspect and the, and our ideological orientation toward acceleration, toward ownership, toward having application builders own more of the technology, customize more of the technology. These are the reasons why we will remain, we have been committed to open source from day one and we will remain committed to it. So we are here at Adopt.ai. Let's talk uh, a bit about adoption. First, maybe let's start with the use cases. Um, what, what are the most uh, important use cases you see today at Mistral? Um, how are they implemented in the organization, and what are the ones for you that create the most value? So the first use case and, and the reason why we created a code-specific model is really developer productivity. Um, software engineers were the first to adopt the technology, and, and if you look at the productivity gains that are made across functions, this is really where this, where this is concentrated today. Um, and, and a couple of issues there is the, the fact that you typically call these models many times over when you do uh, coding, and that requires to have smaller models, so specialized models. That's the reason why we did CodeStral. Um, then you have, uh, I would say, two other directions that are already producing productivity gains. The first is knowledge management, and basically being able to interact with uh, whatever knowledge and documentation your company has in an interactive way. And the second one is customer service, uh, so that, that allows to have higher quality customer service um, that is lower latency, uh, that is addressing more specific needs, that, you're more, that is more granular, and you are already seeing some very large gains in companies that have been early adopters. And so for these two aspects, we're effectively building the product that uh, enables that. When you speak about knowledge management, it's mainly RAG today. Uh, do you see many other applications on knowledge? I mean, RAG is just a way to do it. Uh, there's different part of uh, how you should pour the knowledge into the models. Um, if you have things that move very, very often, uh, you typically connect the database to the model. Um, if you have a corpus of uh, knowledge that is, very, uh, that, that is very extended, you don't want to do RAG on it. You probably want to do what we call continuous training. So take a base model, the one that we produce, for instance, and pour the specific knowledge that you want to build an application for into that model. So, for instance, if you, wanna, if you want your model to know about the French law, you probably don't want to do RAG on it. You want to do this continuous training aspect. It's, uh, it's hard to do. Uh, you need science for that, but we're exposing it so that we make it easy. So, today we are Adopt AI. Uh, and when I introduced the conference, I said that only one company out of 10 has actually managed successfully to implement AI at scale. Uh, do you share this, this vision, this, this constat? And what would be your uh, key uh, advice to uh, increase the adoption of AI within companies? No, so it's a constat that we share. Um, the, 
I would say the, what stands is the, in the way is that to get the most value of AI, you need to build software with AI. And when you build software, you need to comply with the constraints of software. So you need to be able to continuously integrate to improve your software over time. And, and this is actually hard to do because how do you improve an AI system? Well, you need to figure out where it fails. You need to get the data to solve where it fails. And so there's an entire field of uh, managing the life cycle of models, so starting from a base model, uh, making it specific to your task, reduce the latency, deploy it with alpha customers, get some feedback on it, and improve it over time. And that's the only way you can actually be confident when you deploy a software to your end users. And so I think what really stands is the way, in the way is this specialization aspect, this improvement over time aspect. It's actually an unsolved problem. It's very hard to do again. Like this is a scientific problem. And that's what the platform that we're building is going to bring to customers. So in addition to that, can you share a bit your high-level roadmap? Uh, today, you, sh you produced a lot of models, which are fund foundation. Uh, related to what you just said, do you intend also to help being an um, uh, orchestration layer, something to measure the performance, something to measure the trust of the models uh, themselves? Yes, yeah, so we have very interesting tools that are coming at 4 p.m. today uh, for a better model customization. Yeah, so we stay connected. Um, so that's the, that's the very immediate roadmap. Uh, last week we released this CodeStral model. Uh, we're going to be heavy on that software engineering part as well. And in more generally, we now have much more compute than, what, than the, the compute we started with. And so we're training models that are going to reach the frontier in the coming quarter. Cool. And, and maybe to finish with, can you share also your kind of a more high-level, uh, long-term roadmap? Today, uh, it's mainly about text. Do you have something in mind, like more multimodal? And then we see a lot of things happening on the large action model as well. Is it something you're working on? And in general, my question would be, what, what should be for you the next one year, two years uh, going ahead? Yeah, I think the future of Mistral involves being able to process images, videos, audio. Uh, these things are actually useful in an enterprise setting, and, it's, uh, and we're effectively working on those. Uh, when you mention action models, what I think what you really mean is models that can actionate some tools and use APIs and be used uh, to have what we call agentic behavior. So the model is not used to produce text that is read by a human. It's rather used to reason about the tools it should be calling uh, to produce um, a more integrated product uh, and software. I think this is starting to work very well. Again, you have this issue of being able to evaluate over time. This creates a, a lot more new challenges in uh, how, do you, yeah, how do you ensure the quality of the output. Um, but this is something that, uh, that we're investing in. We, our, our latest models can do function calling, so that's the first, first step. You, you provide them with the tools that can be called and they, they call it for, for you. Um, the emphasis we put on the, on the efficiency part, on the fact that small models can actually be very clever, is really important when you build agents, because when you build agents, the LLM isn't going to be read by humans, it's going to be, per it's going to be running on the background. And so, you still need to have a low latency for your user base uh, in order for the UX to be good enough. And so you want to have small models able to figure out what to call, what tools to call under the hood, uh, running sufficiently fast so that the end user application has an acceptable latency. And so that's, there's a, really this problem of efficiency that we're still, that we're good at and that we're still uh, focusing on. Okay, so lots of uh, still... Uh uh, research energies going ahead. So, Arthur, I would like, on behalf of all the community, I would like to congratulate you for your success. Uh, we are very proud to have you in France and Europe. Would you have a, have a final word, maybe, for the ecosystem to encourage to adopt AI? Yeah, I think it's, it's been very useful for us to see the AI ecosystem of startups uh, start building on our platform, and so we are still encouraging it. We have a program to accelerate that. Um, I would say, as a CEO of a, of a large enterprise, the one thing to have in mind is that it's not only about productivity gains, it's about changing the core business, changing the software that are bringing value to your enterprise. And so that means rethinking entirely the processes and assuming that uh, agents, for instance, are going to get better and better and will be able to uh, change the cost structure of, uh, of your core business. So you need to be ambitious because you need to assume that the technology isn't going to stop improving. So we'll stay ambitious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you.